Thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting my channel. Watch the extended versions of my videos when you sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula at curiositystream.com slash Jordan. It shouldn't be news to anyone at this point that pretty much every interaction that you have on the internet is being tracked by something. Whether it be the YouTube algorithm recommending new content, that website that always remembers your login and what you had in your cart, or that time that I tried to buy new jeans on American Eagle and couldn't escape the American Eagle ads for that specific pair of jeans for two weeks, our digital fingerprint follows us across websites and our device. But Google recently announced they would be testing a new way of tracking our data designed to preserve our privacy while still allowing enough information to leak through for targeted advertising. Their method is called Federated Learning of Cohorts, or Flock, and is designed to run on any browser. In fact, Google might actually be testing it on you right now if you use Google Chrome. And interestingly, pretty much every other web browser company wants nothing to do with it. Why? Well, before we get into why every other company seems to think that Flock is a bad idea, let's talk about how you're currently tracked on the internet. All right, so right now, as a person who is currently on the internet, there are a few different ways that websites can track you. One of those ways is through login. In fact, if you're using Google Chrome right now, like I am, chances are you are logged into Google through Google Chrome, which allows Chrome to track you as you go through the internet. And if you're wondering, you can turn this off in your privacy settings. Another way is through cookies, which you've probably heard of, but might not have actually known what they were. In fact, I didn't really understand what they were until I started researching this video. Cookies are created by websites and stored by your browser as ways of remembering things like your login information for a particular website and what you last had in your cart. And some cookies are specific to the website, but others actually track you across multiple websites even after you leave the original one. In fact, websites that use Google Ads can read these cookies and use them to personalize their targeted advertising for you, which is probably why I got ads for American Eagle Jeans for two weeks on every single website I went on. You'd also think that at some point Amazon would figure out that if I bought a shower head, I don't want to buy several more shower heads but that's a different issue. Finally, there's digital fingerprinting, which uses more complex methods such as your browser configuration, your screen resolution, or your operating system to identify you as you enter and use websites. In short, you leave a trail of breadcrumbs as you trace through the internet that can be read by websites and used to target ads towards your interests based on your browsing history. In fact, if you've ever wondered why social media is free, it's because we're the product. These websites collect information on us and sell that to advertisers to use for targeted advertising, and that's how they make their money. Fortunately though, internet privacy is something that the general public has become more aware of in the last couple of years due to concerns around hacking, having passwords that people can't guess, and just general personal privacy. In fact, you've probably seen a lot of advertising about VPNs and how they can protect you from these types of attacks, although that turns out to be a little bit more of a nuanced issue than the advertisements might make you think, and if you want to learn more about that, you should check out Tom Scott's video on VPNs. But with increased public awareness around internet privacy have come some privacy-focused internet browser options, including Brave, Firefox, and interestingly, Safari. In fact, if you use Safari every time you open up a new window, it will tell you how many trackers it has blocked in the last week. There's also been an increased number of proposals for privacy-preserving systems that allow people to go through the internet without being tracked all the time, while still allowing for personalized advertising or some amount of targeted advertising. And that's where Federated Learning of Cohorts, or Flock, comes in. Flock uses federated learning, which is a privacy-preserving machine learning technique, to create cohorts of internet users with different interests. Maybe you're really into tennis, or maybe you're a woman between the ages of 25 and 34. Both of those could be cohorts that companies could then target their advertising around. If you'd like to learn more about the details of federated learning, I have a video on that that I'll link down in the description and throw a card up here. But in short, it is a method of training models locally on mobile devices so that the data never leaves the device, and then sending that model back to a centralized cloud model that averages out all of the weights from everyone's individual data without actually having to see the data itself. And in Google's proposal, the number of flock cohorts would be relatively small compared to the number of users such that an individual user would never be their own cohort. And to be clear, this is not the first privacy proposal of this sort. In fact, of the many internet proposals which have many fun and quirky acronyms, Google's Flock is one of the more recent ones. It was announced as part of a larger proposal for the Chrome Privacy Sandbox, a new initiative by Google which aims to completely block third-party tracking on Chrome by 2022. Instead, they would encourage the use of Flock by websites by deploying it on Chrome, as well as by making it available to other browsers for use. In fact, the code is open source. You can find it on GitHub. So why has every other browser company shied away from Flock? Because it's not a perfect privacy solution. 
for one, giving websites access to a user's cohort data, that is the cohorts that a particular user on a website is a member of, can actually give websites more information about your general internet browsing habits than cookies do because it tracks everything you're doing on the internet instead of just from the websites that are trying to track you already. And along that line, the cohorts that you belong to may reveal sensitive information about you, even if that sensitive information isn't explicitly in the data. For example, Flock might not record information from your medical records if you happen to log into an online health portal, but it might take note of the fact that you have a recurring Amazon subscription for glucose testing strips and infer that you have diabetes. Another issue is that it still might actually be possible to identify you based on your cohorts. Depending on the number of total cohorts created, a website might be able to look at the unique set of cohorts belonging to a user in addition to other information such as their IP address and figure out that you're the same person who was here last week because you're part of the same group of cohorts. One of the ways that Google has proposed to minimize this risk is by only using data from the past week of your browsing history to both preserve your own privacy while also keeping your cohort assignments up to date based on your current interests. However, this can introduce an additional problem, that of being able to track your interests over time. If a website's able to identify you as your cohort assignments change based on your interests that particular week, that information about how your interests have evolved over time can actually be used as another predictive variable for targeted advertising. In short, Flock isn't a perfect privacy-preserving system and may actually introduce additional privacy concerns for browsers that use it. And to be clear, this isn't to say that Google's proposal is bad. In fact, they acknowledge all of these concerns on their website as part of the original proposal and provide a couple ideas as to how these issues might be circumvented or how to design privacy-preserving systems that might minimize the risk of sensitive information being exposed. And as I mentioned, it's not the first proposal a company has had, and none of these proposals are perfect. In fact, that's why most companies are working on internal methods for privacy preservation to work within their own systems. And at the end of the day, if your goal is to optimize the trade-off between maximizing advertising revenue for targeted advertising and preserving user privacy, it's unlikely that there's going to be a perfect solution. Now, I could have delved way deeper into the technical details of Flock, but chances are most of you aren't actually interested in hearing that level of detail. But for those who are, you should check out the extended Nebula Plus versions of my videos. If you're doing my channel, Nebula is a creator-built platform where you get to watch my videos ad-free, and some of your favorite creators, including myself, can create and experiment with awesome content without having to worry about demonetization or paying tribute to the YouTube algorithm. We're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. Want to learn more about how private your information really is on the internet? Check out Digits, a series hosted by Derek Muller on the evolution of the internet. And where CuriosityStream is all about big budget nonfiction documentaries, we're building Nebula so that education creators have the chance to experiment with interesting and unusual content that might not work well on YouTube. On Nebula, you'll find ad-free videos from some of your favorite creators, from Marquez Brownlee to Neurotransmissions to The Coding Train, as well as my Nebula Plus content, which includes extended versions of videos you see on my channel. In fact, if you watched last week's ImageNet video on YouTube, you missed an extended dive into ImageNet and transfer learning in the Nebula Plus extended version. You'll also find Nebula originals like Tom Scott's Game Show Money or Questionable Advice, where Vanessa Hill from Braincraft tries to help me order less takeout. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code Jordan, you can get access to CuriosityStream for 26% off their annual plans, with Nebula included for free as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $15 a year. Many of you have asked about ways to directly support my channel, and the best way to do that is by supporting the sponsor sponsors who support me. So if you'd like to watch my videos ad-free and get access to my Nebula Plus content as well as the Nebula Originals and all of the other creators on Nebula, sign up for Nebula and CuriosityStream at curiositystream.com slash Jordan or using the promo code Jordan. Otherwise, if you like this video, let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check out the video on federated learning if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the details behind that privacy-preserving machine learning method. Otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok if you'd like to catch up with my PhD life, and I'll see you all on Monday. Bye!